Hello and welcome to another helpful tech vid. This slide that's on your screen right now is, hasn't really been touched on. It has been seen in other videos in the series, but I just wanted to come back to this and discuss uh, all the points here because it does kind of give you a, a much better view of Wi-Fi and hotspots in general, discusses the evolution of the technology and uh, just kind of gives you a baseline so that you know what you're looking for, kind of get an idea of what's going on. In a previous video, we went over the VLAN configuration and in a situation where you want to run a production wireless network or an internal wireless network in conjunction with a guest wireless network, the best way to do that is to implement VLANs. <clears throat> and if you watch that video, you'll notice it is relatively easy to do. There's three major things that you need to do and that's create the VLAN on, on the router create a DHCP server for that VLAN and then tag a specific SSID with the same VLAN number. When you dumb it down, it is a pretty simple configuration step. Uh, the next one is setting SSID, which we've covered in uh, previous videos. The next thing I want to do is discuss the difference between 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. And I'm not going to go into too much detail, but the bare bones of it is RF physics. Now, the higher the frequency, the more throughput, the worse propagation, the worse penetration through objects. Knowing that, it's the converse for lower frequencies. The lower the frequency, the lower the throughput, the better penetration through objects, and the better it propagates over anything. And when I say anything, I mean even open air. You can shoot a 2.4 gigahertz link further than you can shoot a 5 gigahertz link. Uh, even over, over open air, it doesn't matter. You will have a mild performance hit on that though as far as throughput goes. Now the reason I say that is that a very common problem that I run into or ran into when I was working on hotspots professionally is that in a scenario where there were a lot of access points and a lot of users involved, a common complaint that I would hear is that most people would be jumping on the 2.4 gigahertz networks and not the 5 gigahertz networks. Well, <clears throat> fundamentally speaking, if you think about it, when a client sees a 2.4 gigahertz network and a 5 gigahertz network transmitting from the same location, same power levels, same SSIDs, apples to apples across the board, if 5 gigahertz doesn't propagate over open, even open air as well, or if you throw in a couple of obstructions, that would be the same for the 2.4 gigahertz network. It's always going to see the 2.4 gigahertz network with a better signal strength than the 5 gigahertz network. And through the properties of Wi-Fi, you always want the strongest signal. So the client is always going to prefer a 2.4 gigahertz network and a 5 gigahertz network over... Uh, over a 5 gigahertz network. Now there are technologies being implemented on the controller or the access point side that uh, is called band steering and that's when a client can see both 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz where the controller or the access points kind of intervene and to a degree force the, the user or the client over to 5 gigahertz instead of 2.4 gigahertz and why would you want that? Well, in a dual band radio, uh, such as the ones we've been discussing, uh, such as the Unify AP Pro or the AC, where there's two cards, your bottleneck is going to be the wireless card itself. It's got plenty of, of wired speed to go around. So if you can fit 40 users on a single radio card, then that means in a dual band device you can support up to 80 users because you got two cards. So that's kind of the difference between the two. So a trick that I've learned to steer users to 5 gigahertz instead of 2.4 gigahertz, if you don't have the band steering capability on the controller or the access point, is you can create the two SSIDs. You create one for your 2.4 gigahertz, call it just guest, and another for the 5 gigahertz and call it guest high speed. And then you would then go into the 2.4 gigahertz and disable the SSID broadcast of the guest high speed. And then go into the 5 gigahertz card and disable the broadcast of the standard guest SSID. This will psychologically get 
clients or customers to connect to the 5 gigahertz card because who wouldn't want more speed? So now, uh, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you can see the table there, the differences between 802.11a versus b versus g versus n versus ac. Uh, and you can see the error rates there and the actual throughputs that you're seeing or that you can see. Um, all of these uh, rates are either from real-world throughput tests or uh, the airspeeds, for example, are from data sheets or just a standardized method of doing things. The real world speed tests will actually vary more so on the device that you're that you're connecting with, your client, and the access point itself. For example, if I take a Unify Access Point Pro and a Unify Access Point, the baseline, and I configure them exactly the same, I will get better throughput through the Pro. A lot of it has to do with packets and frames per second, which is handled by the CPU, not necessarily the wireless card. So the Pro has a beefier CPU and therefore can process more packets or frames per second. You, you can do the same thing with any vendor's devices. You take a Linksys, uh, two random models of Linksys, and I guarantee you if you configure them the same, you're not going to see identical speeds uh, as long as the models differ. You can even do that probably with varying firmware versions, to be honest with you. Now another thing I want to discuss is channel widths. 20 megahertz, 40 megahertz, and 80 megahertz. Well 20 megahertz is what we're most commonly seeing. Uh, that was the first iteration of Wi-Fi and that's what darn near every device out there supports. Well with the, the implementation of 802.11n they introduced 40 megahertz channels. Now what that does is it essentially uses a set number of frequencies. So a 20 megahertz channel chosen on channel 6 let's say is 20 megahertz so the center point of that is on channel 6 okay now it goes 10 megahertz in either direction to total 40 megahertz or I'm sorry 20 megahertz and then the channels increment by 5 megahertz each so si starting at 6 you go 10 megahertz to the right which is two channels and 10 megahertz to the left which is two channels so if you're transmitting on 6, you're actually also touching 4, 5, 7, and 8, as well as 6. So if someone else is transmitting on 4, 5, 7, or 8, they have the potential to interfere with your network. 40 megahertz is essentially the exact same thing, but it doesn't double up in the way you would think. Then over non-overlapping channels of 2.4 gigahertz are 1, 6, and 11. So if you say, well, 40 megahertz is just simply 220 megahertz, then you would say 1 and 6. Well, that's not necessarily true. What they've done is they've taken the, the taper, so to speak, or the bevel out of the, the tail end of that transmission and backed it up one channel. So if you're using 40 megahertz on uh, let's say channel 1, it's going to use a second channel, but instead of using 6, it's actually going to use 5. Now, 2.4 gigahertz, that doesn't really matter because there's not very much spectrum to play with. If you're operating on 1 and 5, the transmissions coming from 5 are also going to touch 6 and 7. So 6 is out of the picture. The only option left is 11. The next one is 80 megahertz, and that's the newest, latest, and greatest. This is implemented in 802.11 AC, which is really, really new. And I don't even believe that this is available in 2.4 gigahertz, and rightfully so. There's not enough spectrum to use. 80 megahertz channels, if they're not already, should only be implemented in the 5 gigahertz band because you have a lot more channels to choose from. And again, just with 40 megahertz doubling up on the 20 megahertz, 80 megahertz doubles up on 40 megahertz. So in essence, what I'm trying to tell you is by using an 80 megahertz channel over 20 megahertz channels, you're quadrupling your spectrum usage. Now, why does this matter? Well, the wider the channel width, the more throughput you're going to get. So an 80 megahertz channel and a 20 megahertz channel, if you compare them in a clear spectrum, 
theoretically an 80 megahertz channel is going to provide four times the throughput that a 20 megahertz channel would. A 40 megahertz channel will provide twice as much throughput as the 20 megahertz channel would. So you have to kind of take that into consideration. If you're setting up a hotspot in the middle of a densely populated area, you're probably not going to have 40 megahertz to play with. Another thing to take into consideration is that not all devices support 40 or 80 megahertz. Some of them are still locked down to 20 megahertz, even ones that are created today. I myself was shocked to find that a tablet that I recently purchased is a 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz so it was a dual band card in there but it would not support 40 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz I was shocked to find that but uh, playing off of that your 80 megahertz is only going to be compatible with your 802.11 AC clients so there are a few smartphones out there I believe the Galaxy S4 and S5 are, are supporting uh, 80211 AC whether or not they're compatible with 80 megahertz or not is uh, I'm not sure I would have to look uh, the next thing to talk about is adjusting power levels to provide great coverage and speeds within the configuration of a UAP and I, I ended up unplugging my setup for the time being but uh, if you click on the UAP and you go to configuration and you go under the radio section you have the option to adjust the power levels and you can do low medium high or custom the way you want to do this is tweak under your own environment particularly if you're if you're implementing multiple access points the reason being is as has been previously mentioned numerous times is there's not a whole lot of spectrum available in the 2.4 gigahertz in 5 gigahertz it's almost a free-for-all but in 2.4 gigahertz you don't have a lot of room to play and I can't stress enough how adjusting power levels can either negatively or positively increase your coverage and your speeds you need to use professional tools such as NSSID -er is one of them and that's probably one of my favorites that will tell you the power levels and tell you the maximum speeds and tell you the noise floor of your uh, connection and you can move around with that you install that on your laptop and it works with almost every radio card out there you walk around and you can take samples from multiple different locations and see where your your dead spots of Wi-Fi are and possibly implement another access point and if you do that you may have to turn the other access point down uh, so it's very important to review that and to be able to provide good coverage and good speeds and not interfere with yourself is probably the number one reason. If you're implementing five 2.4 gigahertz access points and you don't have the RF filtering as previously mentioned in a video, you're not going to have much luck because I guarantee you, you may end up actually interfering across all five access points. But if you take that power level and you turn it down, so that the midpoint where those two coverages meet is just strong enough for your client to be able to connect you're going to be in much better shape and you won't interfere with your other access points so as i discussed earlier uh, with the 2.4 gigahertz versus 5 gigahertz you can disable an ssid on a uap and that is also quite simple you simply go to uh, your unify controller click on an ap go to configuration, go to WLANs, and then there's an override button. If you click on that override button, you have the option to enable or disable the SSID transmitting from that access point. You can override the VLAN tag number on that SSID for that access point only. Or you can override the pre-shared key for the WPA process on that SSID on that UAP only. Now I keep stressing that, you, that UAP only. You are getting into granular configuration here. If you click on an access point and you override that, let's say, VLAN ID, that only applies to that SSID on that UAP. It is not a global change. And disabling a UAP, in essence, um, is simply going in and doing what I said on the previous step, 
and just disabling all of the SSIDs. And that UAP will be considered online, but will not be transmitting anything. So you won't be able to connect to it. No one will be able to connect to it. Is it still consuming power? Yes. Is it consuming as much power as it would be if it was still transmitting? No. What's the alternative? You could use a tough switch to power the access point and then just go into the configuration of the tough switch. You could also use a PoE injector that's compatible with the voltage required for that UAP. Or you could simply go in and unplug the PoE adapter that came with it and that will power the device down. So I'm not sure what I'm going to do what I'm going to call this video, it was kind of an in-between. It was intended to be number five, uh, but this doesn't really talk much about guest access itself. But I'll put this in there. I'll probably call it 5.2 or something because we already have a 5.1. So I'm going to go ahead and end the video. As per usual, if you guys appreciate the work I'm doing, like me to continue the videos, I would appreciate a like, a comment. Uh, if you have any questions, of course, please shoot a comment. If I can't help you, uh, someone else might be able to. I can help when and where I can. I don't claim to be the end-all, be-all of it, but I have seen my fair share of things and might be able to help you in your particular situation. So we'll see you on the next video.